Hello. Welcome to this talk about the impossibility of quantum virtual black box obfuscation of classical circuits. My name is Yves Kududek, and I'm excited to tell you all about this result, which I discovered together with Gorian Alagic, Svika Brakerski, and Christian Schaffner. You can find the full paper on the archive via this identifier. The outline for today's talk is simple. First, I'll tell you about the cryptographic task of obfuscation. Then I'll walk you through a known result about the impossibility of classically obfuscating classical circuits. And immediately afterwards, I'll tell you how we adapted the classical proof to show that a wider notion of obfuscation is also impossible, namely that we cannot even quantumly obfuscate classical circuits. Towards the end, I will put our result into some context. I'll compare it to previous work, some concurrent work that was done around the same time as this result, and finally, I will end with some open questions. Okay, so what is obfuscation? Well, informally, the obfuscation of a program, for example, this simple canonical program that just prints the text, hello world, is another program with the same input output behavior, but that is somehow less intelligible. So there's long string of symbols, letters, numbers. If you run it, it will do exactly the same thing as the short program above, namely, print hello world, but it's very hard to tell what is the specification of this program just by looking at this code. A good obfuscation, as we will see more formally in a minute, reveals nothing more than what you can learn from actually running it and observing its output. Usually when we talk about the obfuscation of, for example, a circuit, we think of another circuit as being the obfuscation. In the example I just gave, a piece of code was obfuscated into another piece of code. But there's no fundamental reason why an obfuscation cannot be any other object, such as an image together with some public instructions on how to interpret that image. And this image on the right represents a function written in the language Piet, named after the artist Piet Monlian for obvious reasons. Um, and again, it's hard to tell just from the image what will happen if you execute it. But also, spoiler alert, why can't a, an obfuscation be a quantum state that you can interact with in order to execute your program. So the obfuscation of a program is really a very broad concept. We can also define obfuscation more formally as Barack and others did in their 2001 paper. The formalization that we will be interested in today is called virtual black box obfuscation. And it is as follows. An obfuscator O for some family of classical circuits F is an algorithm such that first, the obfuscation of the circuit is not too big, so its size is polynomially related to the size of the circuit C. We call this polynomial expansion. Second, if the obfuscation is itself a circuit, then that circuit is functionally equivalent to uh, the original circuit C. Finally, the uh, interesting property called virtual black box, or VBB, it states that any efficient adversary that receives the obfuscation of C and outputs a single bit can be simulated by an efficient simulator that does not get the obfuscation at all, only the size of the circuit, but that has Oracle access to the functionality of the circuit. We'll get into what this means in a bit more detail in the next slide, but essentially anything you can learn about the circuit from this object O of C can also be learned from querying the Oracle for C uh, a polynomial number of times. Now, this definition, as it is stated here, requires that O of C is itself a circuit in the second line. But remember that we can generalize this to the obfuscation being any object, such as a quick picture or a quantum state. And in that case, we need to add a publicly known interpreter to the definition. This interpreter, J, is independent of the circuit, but just contains instructions on how to use the obfuscation, so to say. In the second line, the functional equivalence uh, then changes to saying that executing those instructions on the obfuscation together with an input x should yield the correct outcome c of x. And in some cases, for example, in the quantum setting, we will only require that this uh, equality happens with high probability. And with this version of the definition, we can think of the obfuscation of c in whatever way we like. If it is a quantum state, for example, then the first line will talk about the number of qubits in that quantum state. And the third line um, the, makes the adversary and the simulator become quantum algorithms. Uh, this, in that case, the simulator still interacts with the classical oracle because the circuit C is still classical. 
but the simulator can query its oracle in superposition. Now let's consider this adversarial simulator in a little bit more detail. So what's the difference between getting an obfuscation of C as an input and just interacting with an oracle? Well, getting an obfuscation as an input is quite significant in that it allows this A to hold the circuit, uh, break it up into smaller components, or in general, just compute on it. So if you think again of this PEAT program, you can try to see what happens if you change the blue area into a different color, or if you run the interpreter on the upside down version of the image, or all kinds of things. And the simulator, on the other hand, really only sees inputs and outputs and cannot do all of those things. So for some function families, like learnable functions, this difference really doesn't matter. Those functions are obfuscatable in the VEB sense. But for some other function families, the adversary can really take advantage of having this object to manipulate. And those function families are not obfuscatable. And Barak et al. showed the existence of such an unobfuscatable function family and thereby proving that virtual black obfuscation is impossible in general. And I will explain the details of this impossibility result because our result will be a generalization of it. Um, and so they showed that classical circuits cannot be obfuscated into circuits, but their proof also worked in general for classical objects, but um, let's just focus on the circuit case for now. We're going to define a family of circuits or functions parameterized by an alpha and a beta that will be unobfuscatable. And the circuit is defined in three different cases determined by the first uh, digit of the input and the numbers one, two, and three are really just arbitrary. You can view this as three functions in one and the first digit of the input just determines which case you're going to call. And by the way, I'm going to ignore the fact that the cases have different input lengths, but you can imagine that the inputs can just be padded appropriately so that we have uniform input lengths. Okay, so on input one comma x, the function returns beta if and only if x was equal to alpha. And this is essentially a point function. It's zero everywhere except at the point alpha where it comes with beta. And on input two, the function returns a fixed encryption of alpha together with a public encryption evaluation key for the encryption, which is homomorphic. That means that a party that does not know the secret key, but only knows the public key, can turn the encryption of some value y into an encryption of f of y for any, um, for any efficient function. And finally, input three comma x, the function tests whether x decrypts to beta. And if it does, it returns one, and otherwise it returns zero. And this type of function is known as a compute and compare function. It computes a function on the input, in this case, a decryption function, and compares the result with a target value, in this case, beta. So let's keep this function definition around on the slide because it's quite a lot to remember. And as a final definition, uh, we define the function z alpha beta to be the same as c alpha beta, except for the first line. There, z alpha beta always returns zero. So essentially, in this z function, there is no connection between the values alpha and beta anymore. Now consider the following challenge. Um, you're given an object that's either an obfuscation of c alpha beta or of z alpha beta for random values of alpha and beta. And can you tell which one you got? Well, if we consider the definition of virtual black box obfuscation, then getting an obfuscation is as good as getting oracle access to the function. And from that point of view, you would not be able to tell the difference. One would have to argue this formally, of course, but the only way you're going to see the difference is if you manage to query the first line on an input alpha, but you have no information about alpha except for its encryption. So the probability that you're going to be able to do that and then see the difference is very small. However, if we're just thinking of the obfuscation as another circuit, which you can manipulate and compute on, then you can tell the difference. I'll explain how to do this in just a minute. But you can see that here we have arrived at a contradiction. If the class consisting of the uh, C alpha beta and Z alpha beta were unobfuscatable, then you would not be able to, do, to tell the difference, but you can. And this is the argument that lies at the heart of the Barakadal impossibility proof where they show that this class of, of circuits is unobfuscatable. So how do you tell the difference between an obfuscation of C and of Z? Well, it's given to you as a circuit. Let's call the circuit D. So D is the output of the obfuscation procedure. 
And now what you will do is the following. First, you run d of 2 to obtain an encryption of alpha. Then you evaluate the circuit D homomorphically on an encryption of 1 and that encryption of alpha that you just got. A homomorphic evaluation takes a ciphertext of the input to a ciphertext of the output. So in this situation, you are homomorphically running the first line and you will get either an encryption of beta if your circuit is C or an encryption of 0 if your circuit is Z. And a small side note here, the original proof was found in 2001 when we didn't have homomorphic evaluation. Yet. So in that proof, the circuit actually contains a fourth line for homomorphic evaluation. And that line just decrypts its input, applies a single gate, and then encrypts the result again. And step two would consist of repeatedly calling that line for every gate in the circuit D. So this step would be a little bit more involved, but you would not need the homomorphic encryption with the computational assumptions that come along with it. Okay, but after step two, you have an encryption of beta or of zero, depending on whether you got an application of C or of Z. And the final step is then to run the fourth line of your circuit. If you get a one out, then you know that you have C, and otherwise you know that you have Z. So this family of circuits, C together with Z, for all values of alpha beta, allows an adversary holding an obfuscation to tell the difference between these two cases. Even though a simulator with only Oracle access cannot tell this difference. And therefore, this class is unobfuscatable. And since it's a subclass of all classical circuits, those are also unobfuscatable in general. OK, so Barack et al. have established that classical circuits cannot be obfuscated into circuits. But what about obfuscating classical circuits into quantum states? This potential way out was already observed in 2016 by Alagic and Pfefferman. And they tried to adapt the proof from the bracket all to show that uh, this would not also not be possible. But this adaptation turned out to be quite difficult and also to require tools that we didn't even have back then. And in this talk, I will complete their argument and show that obfuscating classical circuits into quantum state is also not possible. And this result generalizes the Barack et al. impossibility result, but it only heard, uh, holds under a variant of the learning with errors assumption. So as I already mentioned, the same proof for the classical case does not completely go through, and this is mainly for two reasons. First of all, there's the homomorphic evaluation. Uh, now that our obfuscation is not a classical circuit anymore, we cannot straightforwardly break it up into gates that we can homomorphically evaluate. And the second problem is a bit bigger, and it is about reusability. So in the classical proof, we, we ran the obfuscated circuit several times. First, to retrieve the encryption of alpha, then homomorphically, and then finally uh, for the computer compared encryption. And if the obfuscation is classical, that's all fine. But if the obfuscation is a quantum state, it's not so clear that it's possible to reuse it so many times. So for example, maybe the interpreter algorithm is supposed to measure the obfuscation or do other stuff that just somehow destroys the state during computation. So these are the two main issues with porting the Barack et al. proof to the quantum setting. Um, Alagic and Pfefferman were still able to show that quantum circuits are not obfuscatable into reusable objects. So for example, not a quantum uh, circuits, um, but they leave open the most general possibility of obfuscating classical circuits into quantum states. And in our paper, we fix these two issues when we do so as follows. Uh, the homomorphic evaluation, well, I kind of already gave it away by introducing the interpreter in the beginning. Um, there is this public interpreter algorithm, which does consist of gates, so that we can run the interpreter J homomorphically. For that, we do need quantum fully homomorphic encryption, or FHE, with a classical public key, such as the schemes developed by Mahadev or Blagersky. And briefly coming back to my side note from earlier, where I mentioned that in the original proof, the homomorphic evaluation was part of the circuit. Uh, that approach won't work anymore here because the interpreter is now a quantum algorithm consisting of quantum gates. So then if you would do that, the unobfuscatable circuit C would itself become quantum, leading, leading to a weaker impossibility result. And then secondly, the reusability. We note that the, if the output is classical and deterministic, we can measure it without disturbing the state and then re revert the interpreter to retrieve the original obfuscation. Uh, 
which can then be used again. So for example, after we run the second line to obtain the encryption of alpha, we can just measure the ciphertext and then revert the computation to get the obfuscation back. Now this doesn't work if the output is mixed, which it could be after homomorphic evaluation. Then the output may be a superposition of ciphertexts, all for the same value beta perhaps, but still measuring that ciphertext before reverting may disturb the obfuscation. So to get around that problem, we just make sure that the homomorphic evaluation step occurs last. And if you recall from the classical impossibility proof, the order was request an encryption using the second line, then perform homomorphic evaluation of the first line, and then check the decryption using the third line. So in that proof, the homomorphic evaluation is not last. So we need to make a change to our circuit before it will work in a quantum case. So let's zoom in again a little bit. Uh, the change to the circuit C that we make is in the last line. Instead of it being a compute and compare function on an input X, we let it return a classical obfuscation of that compute and compare function. So I haven't changed anything about this function within the brackets here. It's just that the circuit C doesn't compute the function, but it statically returns an obfuscation. And this O sub CC stands for a classical obfuscator of the class of compute compare functions. This is a subclass for which we know that obfuscation does exist under variant of the elder UA assumption. And it's secure as long as the beta is sufficiently random. Okay, so let's return to our original problem. You're given an obfuscation, either C or Z, and you want to figure out which one you have. If you can do this successfully, remember, then we arrive at a contradiction. Since the simulator still cannot tell the difference with only Oracle access, but um, your obfuscation contains something that cannot be simulated with an oracle. So to test whether you got C or Z, you first run the second line like before, only now you run the interpreter on the obfuscation, which is potentially a quantum state instead of a circuit. And you do the same thing with the third line, obtaining the classical obfuscation of this compute and compare function. And after both of these steps, you always revert the computation so that you get your obfuscation state D back for another use. Then, as your last use of the state D, you homomorphically run the first line. In essence, what that means is you homomorphically run the quantum interpreter on the obfuscation and encryption, encrypted input. Just like before, this will either get you an encryption of beta or an encryption of zero, depending on whether you hold C or Z. And after this homomorphic evaluation, your obfuscation state D is potentially destroyed. And for the final step, you run the uh, compute and compare function using this classical obfuscation that you obtained earlier in step two. Uh, and this will get you either the output one if you have C or the output zero if you have Z, just like before. All right, I'll summarize our construction by comparing it to the two earlier works on impossibility of obfuscating uh, classical circuits. First, the Barak et al. result, and also the quantum obfuscation paper by Alagic and Pfefferman. The circuit class that we prove unobfuscatable is the class of all classical circuits. But really what we do is we prove it for a subclass. And this subclass consists of just a point function together with some encrypted and obfuscated auxiliary information. This class is slightly smaller than the uh, 2001 result, but it's still just like in that paper, it's quite an unnatural class of functions. Um, in the 2016 result, the circuit class that can, uh, needed to contain a quantum homomorphic evaluation step, which made the entire unobfuscatable class quantum, leading to a slightly weaker result. Uh, the type of obfuscation that is shown to be impossible is improved from classical circuits in 2001 to reusable quantum states or quantum circuits in 2016 uh, to the most general case of quantum states in our work. And the compromise that we make is that our assumptions are stronger than what was needed before. So in the earlier works, we only needed to assume that one-way functions exist, whereas for our result, we need the quantum fully homomorphic encryption, even with some circular security, although we believe that may not be necessary. Um, and also we need to com the compute and compare obfuscation. And for those two ingredients, we require the assumption that a variant of the learning with errors problem is hard for quantum computer. 
So in summary, we strengthened the impossibility result by showing that an even smaller class of function is unobfuscatable, even if that obfuscation can be quantum state. But we do so at the expense of a stronger but still standard assumption. And I also want to mention a result uh, by Anant and Laplaca that came out very recently and was in, discovered independently of our work. What they do is they study copy protection, where the goal is to produce a quantum state that can be used to compute a function f, but cannot be copied, so to say, into two objects that both correctly compute that function f. And what Anand and Laplaca show is that a slightly weaker notion, which they call secure software leasing, is impossible, thereby uh, answering an open question posed by Aronson in 2009 about the possibility or impossibility of quantum copy protection. And the techniques that they use to show their impossibility results are very similar to what I just presented to you, only their task is even harder. Um, where we only needed to show that an adversary was able to learn a single bit of information, namely which of the two types of, of circuits he got, C or Z, um, what they need for the impossibility of secure software leasing is essentially they need to show that an adversary can learn enough information about the function f in order to produce its second copy. And the way they do this is by making sure that the last line of the circuit, this compute and compare function, returns some secret information if you give it a ciphertext for beta. And this is inspired by techniques used in zero knowledge protocols. So this red position in our proof, we only needed to return one instead of a zero, just to signal the type of circuit to the adversary. But for the secure software releasing, they do something that is uh, more general or more clever returning the secret key in this case so that the adversary can recover more information. Um, they also observe that this uh, argument also implies the impossibility of quantum obfuscation of classical circuits. So I will end this talk with a bit of an outlook into possibly future work. First, it may be possible to get rid of the LW assumption that we've based our result on. To do this, you would have to do two things. First, find an alternative for the quantum fully homomorphic encryption by moving some classical part of it back into the circuit so that you don't have to rely on this LW assumption. And second, you would have to get rid of the computer compare obfuscation, finding a different solution for the fact that the obfuscated state may be destroyed after homomorphic evaluation. And on the possibility side, weaker notions of quantum obfuscation may still be possible. So for example, indistinguishability obfuscation is not ruled out by our impossibility result, and it's getting a lot of attention in the classical crypto world. It may still be possible to quantumly obfuscate classical or quantum functionalities in this weaker sense. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I wish you a great rest of your day.